just a moment. <coughs> Listo, querida. Quedan todos con ustedes. Yo me voy. Chao, chao. Nice to meet you. Great meeting for you. Sim, Sim, já estou. É porque, é porque eu, estou, eu estou em dois perfis aqui, aqui mas, mas o de intérprete já está ativado. Ah, ok. Tchau, tchau. Tchau. Bye, bye. Vamos iniciar? So, let's get started. Um bom dia, tarde, boa noite. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wherever in the world you are right now. I would like to thank you. It's one more uh, self-managed uh, activity of the world on World Social Forum. The, our thematic is justice, and we will talk about injustice. Or type. We're going to have a round of conversations, which was organized by CIRAND International of Shared Communication with Institutori and the Councils of Caciques, the uh, indigenous leaderships, Brazil indigenous leaderships of Ponta Grande. First of all, I would like to thank the president. I'd like to talk about the importance of the necessary and fundamental issues that we see regarding the types of justice and injustice that we see potentialized, especially after the COVID-19 pandemic. We have seen the violations and the narrative construction, the statements that are really jeopardizing to the originary and traditional peoples, but not only that, all the population in Brazil, this movement has intense been has been intensified and i would say that it has somehow jeopardized the ones who should be the beneficiaries of public policies the state here the state the constitution of 1988 is clear in the fifth article uh, stating that the fundamental rights have to be respected and public services have to be offered it's not just like something that I want or I don't want. It's something that has to be done. The traditional peoples have the right to it. And what is highlighted is especially the statements and actions of the ones who are today in the power, in the federal power of Brazil, of the Brazilian state, and has violated several fundamental rights of the originary peoples that were achieved for 500 years. Our round of conversation will reflect upon this. What is justice, social justice? What are the injustices? And we're going to use as an example, real life situations. For instance, the situation of the indigenous land of Ponta Grande, Ponta Grande in the extreme south of Bahia. And it was in this location in Cabralha that the, that the Portuguese arrived in Brazil for the first time. So they, they have been there since the beginning of the country. So this dispute of the need of the originary people to prove that this land is theirs, although they have been there since before the colonizers arrived, it's quite complex. And it has brought many diff different types of difficulties. I would like to start our talk asking for a Siki Sirata. I'm going to write, I'm going to start from my left side. I'm going to ask him to introduce himself for whoever doesn't know him. And I'd like you, Kasiki, to tell us how you see these problems with justice and the permanent struggle that you have to have access to public services, such as 
uh, water, san sanitation, health, education, and also the right to come and go to access the ancestral spaces, including the religious spaces, to speak to your deities. And all the attempts of occupation and prohibitions for you to access these spaces. So, Asiki Sirata, it's a pleasure to have you with us. He's speaking his native language. Greeting Vladimir, Tatiani, Juvenal and others. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kasik Sirata. I'm from the Patashok people of Bahia. My, I'm based in the municipality of Porto Seguro, and I'm also president of the Council of Caciques of the region of Santa Cruz de Cabralha and other communities around Porto Seguro. Talk, talk about this point, this issue of the territory of Ponta Grande. The Indio Vivo Reserve, due to many resistant movements, is marked as a Patasho territory. It's an area of eight over 800 hectares to a forest, and we strengthen our culture and environmental preservation here. We are neighboring the territory of Ponta Grande. We are also part of the council of the territory of Ponta Grande. The president of the council is present here, Pasik Albert. And well, as a Patashó people and the originary people of Brazil, we have observed that the laws of our country are really failing regarding acknowledging the indigenous territories. We have encountered many people uh, in the polit politics area saying that we are the first owners of this land, but in practice, we have been the last because our territory has been constantly violated. Our rights to be here have been violated. It's where we live, where we raise our family and we take our livelihood. And we are taking the risk to lose it. Our entrepreneurs that come from other places of the country and other countries that want to build their, their enterprises in the sacred lands of the indigenous people. And many times the justice authorities close their eyes to that and they leave us without our rights. We have this example, which was the fight that we are undertaking in our territory. We have around 500 families here and we suffered uh, the loss of land, the request for us to leave our this past from our land. There is a, an entrepreneurial look in the region. They want to build an, an eco resort here and destroy our greatest patrimony, which is our land. When we talk about the land, uh, when we talk about talking about conquering the land, is to take care of it. In our thought, there is no honor to the land. We are just the heir of this land and we leave our footprints, but we think of the continuity of the existence of the land and of our people. But the, the company owners don't think like that. They want to deforest, make, have deforestation work and, and destroy the environment. So we, as indigenous people, we are always trying to keep our territories, but we are being pushed and we, we are at risk of losing our identity in our land. We try to preserve our culture, preserve the environment. And I'd like to tell you that the tribes and all the relatives in lands that haven't been marked, we, we follow up their struggle and we, we know they have many types of needs when they have the land for 
for you when you have a, a land for you to work for your people and you have no return because the land is not legalized so because of that you have no access to electricity you have no access to school. our children we cannot have wells or things like this other infrastructure things to have we had the power being installed in our construction works that were drilled in our territories to serve our people and these two projects infrastructure people uh, projects to guarantee the survival of our people we don't have this right to use our own space our struggle has been constant as the the elder elders say we haven't started this struggle and it and we will not finish it our children will come and the, the fight will continue and realize that we have partners in the institution in the, in the governmental institutions that have the commitment to the originary peoples we have a great example of dr vladimir for example he has been following up this process of regaining the land. And also there's another attorney, Dr. Daniel. We have the fruit of our land, the hope for our people, which is Dr. Samara Patasho. He, she is an indigenous person, indigenous woman, and she has been defending our people with all her strength. So in this moment, we've been building this partnership with many institutions we have access to institutions where federal prosecutors they have access to our our situation we provided a document to this area that 40 percent of the land that we have is a preservation area and 40% of the area is where we have the, the swamps and Mossurunga, which is a very sensitive uh, kind of vegetation, kind of uh, plant. So we need to take care of this area. This, this is the area that we're going to show the society that the indigenous people are not invaders or destroyers. We are the, the real guardians of our territory in the nature. So. We have this area of 40% of the territory that is called preservation area. But we don't see FUNAI or IBAMA, CMBU, or other institutions saying that we need to take care of it. Our leaders, along with the community, have this consciousness to have the guarantee of the land and preservation of the land. Several, we have been facing several fights and others will come, but in this moment, we need to be united to have partners with the competent institutions to make them aware of our fight. As the others say, you just respect when you are aware of it. So when you, when you don't know the history, you will not give support. But when we start having the dialogue with the society, indigenous people start this campaign of partnerships and people will have participation and they will have the, the building of awareness and with the partnership of dr daniel dr vladimir and dr samara and the federal prosecutors that are also aware of our situation we norm we usually call them for, for for help and our relative that we have from the indigenous people dr dina Montusha, we are proud of him he's a young man inheriting a great wisdom and uh, taking this this cause with a lot of responsibility so he's from a different people he's not patasha but we are all indigenous people and and our fight is for life and that makes us equal so that we feel very strong when we we see a lot of these people helping us and not only us, but other people are facing complicated situations and we need to hold hands 
so that our struggle will be stronger, more, be more visible, and then more partners can help us to walk this path and to get what we want, which is to have the officialization of our territories and the guarantee of our culture and our population. When we talk about injustice, we mean we are people who who experience injustice in, on a daily basis. In the pandemic times, there was a decree in the official diary saying that there was a suspension of all the uh, injunctions for land processes. But in our region, one of the authorities that say that says that claims that, that he knows the law, he tried to manipulate and break this action that came straight from the Supreme Court. And when we received this news and the Council of Cassix received this news and we had articulation with other leaderships in our region, we required the strength of our people and our ancestors to fight because we see the injustice right on our faces and we need to face it. We need to fight it with all our strength. So I'd just like to provide this testimonial to you of our situation and our practice as an, orga an organization of the Patasha movement. In our people today, we have two councils. I'm the president of the Council of Caciques of Santa Cruz de Cabralha, and there is another council in Porto Seguro. So we are we have four municipalities in this region, Porto Seguro, Cabralha, Prado, and Tamaraju. And the, the more effective councils are the ones from Porto Seguro and Cabralha. So this is just a little bit of my of a testimony of what's happening here. I'd like to thank you all for the opportunity to talk about our struggle. And we are happy for having this aid from the institutions that opened their doors for us to test, to give the testimonial of our struggle. Because many times the society only have contact with the indigenous people through the books or through the media uh, channels. But many times these uh, types of media just provide a negative image of us. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for your contribution. And I will uh, now hand the floor to Cacique Tukum, and he's right there in the middle of all this turmoil. I'd like to listen from him, Zé Roberto, Cacique Tukum, how he has observed the situation, the situation in Ponta Grande, and all the, the movement that is happening in the scope of justice. And then, after that, Dinaman will speak to us as well. Now, Cacique Turcum, please, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, all you, ladies and gentlemen, everyone who are listening to me. Can you listen to me well? Just to give a little testimonial uh, in line with what the president of the Council of Six mentioned, his statement was quite positive regarding our people. We have seen law violations here in our region all the time. In this country, people know that we are the originary people, the first ones to, to occupy this land. However, we have seen violations over our people. Ponta Grande territory, which is centralized most part in the municipality of Porto Seguro and some of it in the municipality of Cabralha. I'm the president of the council of the Ponta Grande. So we are in the middle of this turmoil. We keep moving lawsuits. There was a decree that during the pandemic, we could not have any um, legal actions towards our cause, but we see it's not this decree is not being obeyed. 
and we don't know how the situation is going to be, if it's the, this junction is going to help us or not. We know that many times there's nothing in favor to us. Everything is against our people. We are in this territory and we are inside the territory in which our forefathers lived and we inherited this place. And the justice knows that it is an indigenous territory, but they give the rights to the white man who have the who have a more financial power, especially foreign people, people from other countries. They come here to make investments and take the indigenous people from our territory. But thankfully, we have our partners and friends to be advocate for us. Today, we have a government in Brazil that is an anti-indigenous people government. So we know that with him, with them in power, we know that our rights will be violated all the time. And we know that we are the first peoples to, to have lived in this land. And we are here to fight, to be at war. Nothing was easy. Nothing has been easy for us. And we know it's hard. I think we had a little connection problem with Kasiki Tukum. His phone seems to be muted. But it has to do with what we are saying in this round of conversations, which is the conditions of access to communication. So once again, it is clear. So Kasiki, welcome back. You can continue. So we can we see these violations of rights here. On the 9th of this of February, we're going to have an audience, and Dr. Vladimir and Daniel are with us in this fight. They came here, and there was a litigation of a 400 uh, square meter land. That the man said he was the owner, but he's not. So we keep uh, participating in these uh, trials, and th no, there's nothing in favor to us, especially in this government. So our concern is for the the legal powers put the invaders in favor or give advantage to the invaders, and we are really concerned with this situation that maybe. Uh, in the future, in the near future, we can have conflicts and uh, the media and the press would say that we are wrong. So we are concerned about that. So this is what I have to say. Our Siratan, Kasik Siratan gave a great statement and we are here also to contribute with you. And we thank you for the opportunity to be in this meeting, participating, and we hope that we can count on you in this territorial struggle. Thank you, Kasiki Tukun. It's always important to listen to you. I think that the importance of your narrative is really essential. And we we should open more spaces for these discussions. Now I'd like to listen to Dinaman Tusha. He's a lawyer from APIB, he's a national counselor of human rights. And he is in a very complicated moment in his life with a lot of work to do. His council receives many demands. In the past years, they have increasingly received many demands. Oh, and also just to remind you that Dr. Smara, uh, she she's an indigenous woman and she's helping us with this territorial fight. It's not only for of the Patashaw people, of all indigenous people. So Ajinama, he's been working hard for our rights, the rights of our peoples. So it's excellent to have these people, people, educated people to help us. Yeah, this leadership is really important. And just to wrap up before I bet I give the floor to Dinamo, the participation of the National Council of Human Rights in the past years has been really key to 
say, to bring stronger demands to the state. This is the role of, of the council, to show the, the rights violations and to do the advocacy of the people who have the rightful, the rights. Thank you, Tati. I thank you all who are watching us. My name is Dilema. I'm from the Tusha uh, people. I'd like to salute Micah Six, Siratan, and Tukun, my dear relative Tiara Atasha, and also Dr. Vladimir, Sheila, everyone who's here to participate in this debate. I think it's important to highlight what Sirata mentioned and also Asiki Tukum mentioned. These are systemic problems. What we live today are uh, remainders of a colonization that is full of prejudices that have not finished, have not, have, have not been extinguished. There are many stigmas of, and we don't see the end of this process of colonization, this endless process of colonization. This process was quite strong in Brazil and it, it impacted the, the indigenous peoples in a very drastic way. We have suffered in uh, of this, the remainings of this, this process. This colonization process that is still in progress, it has a very structural and institutional racism. And this institutional racism, uh, racism prevents the judici judicial powers to take decisions that contraries decisions of higher ranks. For example, the highest rank of the law in Brazil, which is the Supreme Court. There, there was a decision of the Supreme Court that does not allow for injunctions to happen in this in these processes of any kind of uh, ownership repos repossession. What happened in Ponta Grande with the Tuxá people and Tupinaba people, this concession of ownership repossession and all the lawsuits that have possession uh, lawsuits, they have had been suspended in the pandemic uh, context, and they are still suspended. And and the, the legal branch, and when we say that there is uh, an, an institutional uh, racism, that we know that when a law institution disobeys uh, an extreme decree, an extreme order from the Supreme Court, so it's not like it's just the indigenous people complaining. These are concrete facts that it ha that happened, especially in the northeast area of Brazil, and now it is expanded to the south of Brazil. We see that another injunction was was granted here in Bahia with the judicial body from APIB and other institutions. They have followed up all these process, processes from close. The federal public ministry and uh, the popular attorneys and other institutions have been monitoring these violations that are done even by the legal institutions. But we know that it all has to do with a political project that is in power now in, in Brazil. They are carrying out a process, they're actually continuing a genocide process that started in the invasion of the Brazilian state. The indigenous people, Tupinaba, Patasho, and others, none of the indigenous people were able to overcome this in a context that the Brazilian population doesn't have the, the understanding that we have rights, it's a constitutional right, the guarantee of these territories that are that belong exclusively to the indigenous people. And the legal institutions are not fulfilling their role of monitoring the territories that have been granted to us. In the colonial process, 
many indigenous communities have been exterminated. Then we had a redemocratization process in Brazil in 1988 that with a constitution that assured this right of land for the indigenous people. But now we have people, politicians that are in the field, in the political field, such as the president of Brazil, saying that they will not fulfill the constitution of uh, guaranteeing the land for indigenous people. He's already disobeying the law because he had an oath to the constitution when when he when he took office so we cannot allow this thing to happen or even the disobey disobeying of the orders of the supreme court these movements weaken the in indigenous policies and we have people in the in the judiciary branch that are in alliance with with the government and other forces that are putting the democracy into fragility and the indigenous people are witnessing this attack to our democracy and to our constitution that brings terrible consequences to the traditional communities indigenous people the most needy populations and then we can include the black movement, the women's movement, and many violations that are in the hands of the current um, president of Brazil in a project that is aligned with the great corporations and economical powers that finance this political power in the name of capitalism in order to take the indigenous lands and the indigenous rights. As an example of this region of Prado, Porto Seguro, and Cabralha, and these companies want to gain, to take by force all these spaces, ignoring all the international treaties that Brazil has signed. Also, it's important to mention that in Brazil, we see there is uh, dismantling of the indigenous policies and the weakening of FUNAI, the, the institution that is responsible to, to support the indigenous. And this dismantling is being witnessed in, in our institutions in uh, FUNAI. FUNAI has a key role in the indigenous policies. What's happening is that the current government is uh, dismantling uh, the structure of FUNAI, of the, the institution that was supposed to give support to the indigenous, and it is impacting the life of indigenous people in Brazil. FUNAI today has people that are against our peoples. So we have the partnership with our partners, very strong partners in the guarantee of the implementation of the constitutional text, and they have been brilliantly uh, fulfilling this role of fighting for the indigenous people. I've, I've been following up the process here in Ponta Grande in a cl very closely, and we could guarantee these people to be in their territory. And this guarantee is not only a, a historical reparation, it is just a fulfillment of the um, ch charter, the constitutional charter of Brazil. Not all of the people in, in the judiciary branch have knowledge or acknowledge the constitutional right that the people have. They don't, rec they don't recognize the causes of the rights of the indigenous people and they, keep, they end up jeopardizing our situation, the situation of the indigenous people, especially in the state of Bahia and the northeastern region of Brazil. So we need to keep fighting for that. We want to have our laws enforced in order to stop the jeopardizing of the colonization and to guarantee the historical reparation and the end of this genocide. 
We thank you, Jinama. We thank you for your words. It's really important for this strength of what all you said in terms of belonging, understanding that you belong. You say that the land is yours and we believe it. You have, you want to have your rights to be fulfilled. Now we're going to hand the floor to Cacique Juvenal. He had just uh, come in our, our meeting. Also, Tiara Patasho. And I'd like to thank the presence of Sheila Secon. She is part of the International Council of the World Social Forum. And we are happy to have, he, have her here with us. And in the background, my dear son, he wants to participate in our live transmission. He is saying hello to the spectators. So this is my son, guys. So Dr. Vladimir, please, the floor is yours. Hello, I'd like to salute you all. First, I'd like to thank you for the invitation. Tatiana, you have been a great partner in this struggle. Also the World Social Forum, providing this space for this important discussion. I'd like to salute the caciques and all the, the indigenous leaders. I don't need to talk for too long because today it is important to listen to the, the communities and it's their space of speech. They are suffering. They have been suffering for many years. These abuses, this law, I mean, this right violations. I intend to focus more specifically in the most recent um, things that happened. Because if we talk about the traditional peoples in Bahia, we need to have many and many live streams and meetings to be able to talk about all that. So as a regional defender of human rights in Bahia, I have been dealing with collective demands in, 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 in our state, in the state of Bahia. I have an, a strong work in the Quilombola uh, community and the indigenous community. They have been suffering abuses throughout the time. And I have contact with many indigenous uh, peoples and communities. And these rights violations, they are systemic and they keep repeating. They, they are uh, common. The strategies are repeated. The way of violating has been repeated. And if this has been happening for many years, it was intensified in the current uh, social stage that we, 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 we are and with the current federal government that we have in Brazil. We can see the growth of an extreme right wing movement and the, these people are very racist. And Dinama said that, he, uh, I would like to quote Dinama when he mentions the structural racism that is part of the governmental policy in Brazil and is also becoming stronger in our society and also the institutional racism that also Dinama mentioned. And we need to keep these uh, words in mind and we need to make it clear and combat these things. The structural racism, we see that there is an articulation to take the rights of these originary people. And also they are occupying important uh, institutions that were supposed to support the indigenous people, such as FUNAI and INCRA. The policy that is implemented today does not aim to, ass to assist their uh, their purpose, the purpose to which it was created, which is to help the indigenous people. Now back to the specific topic of this meeting, we identified some occurrences in Ponta Grande. And we have this example of Ponta Grande, but you can extend these examples to other indigenous peoples and also the Quilombola communities. 
we have a human rights system in with different regional centers in Brazil. And all the testimonials that we listen around the country are very similar. In Bahia, we see we see it more strongly, but it can be seen in other states as well. We realize that some actions of ownership repossession are happening during the pandemic, which is really serious. In the beginning of the pandemic, the federal Supreme Court saying that this ownership rep repossession processes should be suspended to reduce the, the, the contamination of COVID-19 in these uh, communities that are quite vulnerable to such viruses. So the federal court, Supreme Court ordered that. And the federal justice of the city of Annapolis had uh, had been granted this ownership repossession. And at the moment, I thought that I understood that that situation could be an example for other situations in which many entities of civil society, lawyers, and lawyers that are indigenous um, people, such as Sam Samara, Atasha, we worked in this process and we could suspend this decision to grant this ownership repossession to, to these white men with a formal complaint reminding the order from the Supreme Court to suspend the ownership uh, repossession processes. But two weeks ago, when I was visiting other indigenous communities that also suffered some violations, I had the opportunity to meet leaders, indigenous leaders of Ponta Grande, and I was aware of other violation violations, some determinations that stated that no any kind of of construction work or infrastructure infrastructure works had to be stopped in that in that land, which is outrageous. Also, two ownership repossession processes are happening and the judge authorized it to February 9th. We, we started to speak to some colleagues in uh, Brasilia and we want to order, send a, a request to the Supreme Court to suspend this trial. We had a We've had a victory last year and we want to have this other one now, which is what is something that is really concerning, as Dinaman mentioned, is that the same problem happens in other places with a very conservative uh, legal power in some municipalities that tends to privilege the patrimony and the property to owners of large lands taking the right of livelihood and possession and taking the human dignity of these communities. In my point of view, it is really concerning because if we know that the federal government in the scope of the executive branch, the judiciary branch, should really take care of the human dignity. That's not what we see. We see that the judiciary institutions in many municipalities, they are in favor of these um, landowners, these powerful landowners. Of course, it's not everyone in, in the judiciary powers, but we have to be very careful and we'll...
É, mas esse, essa é a realidade que eu queria colocar, eu não quero me estender. Eu quero mostrar que, durante a pandemia, essas situações têm é, é, ganhado relevo e merecem ser, merecem ser destacadas e merecem ser combatidas. E, é, e o mais importante de tudo, ouvir nesse momento as comunidades, buscar entender e buscar articular com outras entidades públicas e da sociedade civil, talvez seja a saída para é, resguardar certos direitos e resistir a esses ataques. Então, é isso que eu queria colocar. Eu agradeço a oportunidade. Obrigada, doutor Vladimir. É muito importante essa fala de você e de Dinamã, no sentido de que essa discussão não é uma discussão só do querer ou do é uma discussão legal e de direitos muito importante na retaguarda e que é necessário fazer essa defesa. É, os barulhos da sala. É, mas de toda é, eu vou passar para a Tiara, eu queria que ela comentasse um pouco. Tiara é, é uma liderança feminina né, na, na aldeia, ela tem, tem estado muito na frente da defesa desse território, lembrando também que, pegando o gancho que Dinamã comentou, é um racismo institucional, mas as mulheres são as primeiras que sofrem esse racismo. Né? Somos nós, as mulheres, que acabamos tendo que Uh, assumir diversos postos e, e, e somos, um, como é que eu posso dizer, uh, recebemos impacto de diversas coisas no nosso dia a dia. Então, eu queria passar a palavra para a Tiara, eu queria que ela se apresentasse, por favor. Né? Bem-vinda, Tiara. Pode falar. Obrigada, Tatiana. Boa tarde a todos. Tá, dá para dar para ouvir? Acho que sim. É, boa tarde a todos né, e a todas, muito importante nesse né, debate, ainda mais no contexto ao qual nos encontramos. Né? Meu nome é Tiara, sou é, liderança aqui da aldeia Pataxó Novos Guerreiros, também estou como coordenadora do grupo de mulheres, né? e é nesse meu local de fala, né, como mulher indígena, liderança, mãe e filha, que eu venho aqui também é, fazer os relatos, né, qual a gente, quanto mulher indígena, vem sofrendo esse território, né? com a falta de energia, com a falta de água, com uma saúde inadequada e, principalmente, né, com a impossibilidade de a gente estar dentro dos nossos territórios. Né? A garantia de termos, termos território demarcado é a garantia da vida. Né? Como o Ciratã pautou muito bem, a gente tem um território como se fosse algo para gente, como se fossem nossas vidas mesmo. E nós, mulheres indígenas, temos essa uma preocupação né, de estar lutando pelo território por uma garantia melhor para, os nossos, para as nossas futuras gerações, para os nossos filhos. Né? A gente vê que, quando os nossos direitos são violados, né, como o direito à garantia de água, a gente sente a necessidade de sair de nossos territórios para estar buscando é, água né, em outras localidades. E aqui, como a, a, são duas cidades turísticas, né, Porto Seguro e Santa Cruz Cabralha, são cidades muito expostas mesmo a, 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 não, a não indígenas. Então, com essa saída de dentro da nossa comunidade para ter acesso à água é, e etc., a gente fica muito exposto né, à, à questão do vírus, principalmente. Né? Então, quando a gente... A gente tem essa preocupação de estar dentro da nossa comunidade, cuidando de nossas crianças, cuidando de nossas anciões, mas a necessidade humana de que é de ter acesso à água nos obriga também a, muitas vezes, estar saindo de dentro dos nossos territórios para, ter, para pegar né, aquela água e trazer para dentro da comunidade. E nesse percurso né, que a gente faz, que muitas mulheres indígenas faz, é, pode ser nesse, nesse esse pequeno período né, que pode estar sendo contaminado por o vírus e aí está trazendo também o vírus para a nossa comunidade. O que vem acontecendo aqui na Aldeia Novos Guerreiros né, com essas questões de, de eliminar tanto territorial quanto esse processo de eliminar para energia e para água é uma questão que nos atinge diretamente, porque a gente tem um território aqui é, como, um, como algo sagrado mesmo, a gente, a gente cuida, a gente preserva, a gente planta, a gente chama a atenção de, de muitas outras pessoas para a preservação ambiental, né? A gente tem essa preocupação de estar sempre cuidando da nossa mãe natureza, mas os olhos né, lá de fora de pessoas não indígenas têm outra visão. O, o momento que a gente tem de estar tá pensando é, em um bem comum entre todos, né? O que a gente pensa em uma comunidade 
the ones who are outside the community only think of the, the capital of a profit. And it's against to everything that the indigenous people believe in what we fight for. We fight for common good to all. We want to have the territory that is uh, delimited. The delimitation of our, our land is important because we avoid conflicts with farmers and other, other people. And the federal government is not enabling these lands to be marked. So we think that the territory, indigenous territory, the Brazilian territory, should should all be indigenous. But we need to have we need to make anthropological studies to guarantee if that territory is indigenous or not. There are many studies that are happening, but the president Bolsonaro said that he will not delimit it the territory. And then with this, we have the violation of rights. Recently, what really shocked me is the disappearance of two indigenous children. They were, they were found dead. And other Guajajara child, they were, they were killed. That's what happens because of the the lack of the limitation of the territory, this constant conflict, this constant uh, violence to the peoples. The media uh, sometimes does not show that. So we as youngsters who have access to other resources, to technology, we can use the social media to show what is happening in our communities because we can be in the Patasha community, but it happens to all the Tupinaba peoples and other peoples. So indigenous uh, fight is a collective fight. If my community is, is suffering for the lack of justice and the constant attacks to our communities, I am sure that the other peoples are also being violated. And for this guarantee of rights is that we know that the constitution guarantees to us that we are, and we are there in the front line, showing that our communities are suffering. So Tatiana, in this moment, this is the moment for us to say, how they talk about the importance of, of this, this discussion. Not many people want to listen to, to what's happening. People want to listen to things focused on folklore or, or other things about the indigenous people. But we don't live folklore. We are citizens of, uh, of Brazil and we have been here for more than 520 years. When the Portuguese people came here, they inserted the European way of life in our people. And then they they did the genocide of the indigenous people. So from that time until now, look at how many people have been uh, killed and, ha and have been suffering. Many people don't know about that. Even the issue of the racism. When, for example, when we use cell phones, people say, why indigenous use cell phones or have access of white people? So we keep deconstructing these ideas, but focus on this, this construction. We also need to construct. When we deconstruct the wrong ideologies or thoughts, we start, uh, and also we also just deconstruct the European thought. We start constructing a new story. So we need to help our friends in this moment. The indigenous cause is a cause for all, not only our people. We fight for the environment, for the air, for clean water and clean air. And this regards everyone, all the population, indigenous or not. So we need to keep talking about that discussion, discussing these topics. And that affects directly the indigenous women, children, and elders. So Tatiana, thank you so much for this space. 
I think it's extremely necessary. I'd like to thank for the presence of all the caciques, uh, Jinaman, uh, and other representatives of indigenous people. So we are here to guarantee the rights for the indigenous peoples. We need to guarantee the, the limiting of the territories, indigenous territories. When we have this, we guarantee our rights to live in Tiawede. Oh, you're so beautiful. And I feel really moved. Not that the, the previous statements were not beautiful, but it's a woman, a young woman, so it's more beautiful. Now we're going to invite our next guest for his statement. Can you hear me there? Maybe he lost connection. He's here. Your microphone is muted. You need to turn, you need to unmute your microphone. Oh, it's on now, right? Yes, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here too. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you for inviting me. Well, we are here in this round of conversations. You are from Paiaia people. You have been participating in this uh, fight for many years. You are located in Chapada Diamantina. It's more in the northwest of Bahia. The discussion that we are having today, it's regarding injustice and the insufficient offer to the access of public services that the people's, originary peoples have. This has been quite strong. And as Tiara mentioned, and the other cacique is mentioned, fight to have access to electricity, where everyone should have access, especially the indigenous people who are near the urban areas, seems to be out of the standard. This thing of having to fight to have access to have schools in your territories or sanitation or water. There are peoples in Bahia that they didn't have access to drinking water. So can you talk about that? I would like you to talk a little bit about this and to think of the context of what are the social injustices and also thinking of the challenge that we have the so-called new normal, which is the COVID-19 pandemic. It was hard before. Now imagine in this context. So you need to have access to infrastructure services, also healthcare. The beginning of the pandemic, there was this unbalancing of thinking of, do we isolate the indigenous territories? No one can go in there. But if no one can go in there, not even the assistants can go in there. And this situation was unsure for several months. Some territories were isolated, or others were more structured, and this impacted your life conditions. COVID-19 is not like a simple cold or a flu. Vaccination has started, but the, the access to vaccination are really below the necessary, not only to the indigenous people, but to the whole country. The perspective of vaccination is far from being reasonable, let alone the situation of the indigenous children who should have access to schools. Yeah, the, having remote uh, classes is really complicated, especially in the indigenous areas uh, in which there is no access to internet. So I'd like you to talk a little bit about all this. I feel really happy to be invited to be talking to you. The territories belong to indigenous people, and I defend that 
indigenous are indigenous in the land, on the land, or on the heavens, in the sky. I'd like to start reading a poem called Casa da Lapa. My house is like a, like a Lapa tree. The altar is the roots. I see the shade, the smell, the wind, and the serpent is the dog that will leave and it comes back later and bites us. So, the poetry to me, it is a, 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 a weapon. I've written different books, novels, and also po poetry books. And I try to, to have in the written word, in the, in the beauty of poetry, to narrate what we cannot express in other ways. Here we have a state and this serpent or this snake that I mentioned in my, in my poem comes and bites us. This, this state is, the, the snake represents this state. So the state was supposed to be the state, the, the government is like, a, a, an evil mother that changes the food or the blanket as she wishes. And I see that the indigenous people who lived in this continent, the sick continent, the way they used to live. And I don't, I'm not interested on abandoning history. I'd like you, I'd like you to pay attention to what I'm saying here. Dr. Valdemir and Tiara Dinama. I'd like to thank Tiara so much and other caciques. I, I, I'm really attached to history. The history narrated and simply repeated from generation to generation. This land is ours. That's how I see it. Normally, I say, if you imagine that the indigenous peoples that lived here by the shore of the sea, they feed freely whenever they needed the, 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 the fish. When they were tired of the fish, they would go up the mountains and they would eat a shoe. They would search for arueira to make the, the, their, their medicine, the jabuticaba, and they would feed from it. And when the European people came here, all the known diaries or the journals, none of these journals say that they found an indigenous man or woman that was thin or malnourished. So the sacred land allowed the indigenous people not only to be healthy, but also well fed. And then suddenly we fell in this pit in which the white man becomes, for example, our land in an altar and the state as the snake the altar that I mentioned in the poem and the snake that I mentioned in the poem. If the altar is out, the snake will feel like biting you. What we realize, Katya, Vladimir, uh, Dinama, is that we need to understand what it is to be an indigenous person more than just be fighting for a piece of land as that this territory is ours. Of, of land. And when we talk, we talk about the constitution, well, 
the constitution changes according to the decisions of the powerful people. Many institutions didn't even talk about the indigenous people. So we saw the advancement of this constitution could have two articles in this constitution. Uh, your microphone is a little, uh, could you uh, put it a little higher? Can you turn up your microphone a little bit? Oh, well, let me see. If we can have these two articles. And I think we are obliged to recognize that we exist. We are here. And we see some interesting people. And there was this guy, Josi Góes, and uh, he was a former congressman. I met him during campaign. I met him during the Constitution times. I met him as a writer when I was a writer. And he defended democracy. Now, he is now against my brothers and sisters from the indigenous people of Ponta Grande. That is, he's try, trying now to take the land from them. This guy, the jerk, he was there fighting for democracy. He wrote a book called Our Everyday Envy. The title of his, of the, this guy, the, the book that this guy wrote, The Anatomy of Hate, the Envy of, of Our Everyday Lives, The Seven Plagues That Dominate the Country. So. Now, let's see if he himself is not one of these plagues. This guy, he's an, an elderly man now, but he would call Antonio Carlos Magalhães a monster, and now he is the monster. So we need to expose these people, to put the finger in, in, in the wounds, to expose this man, these people who are being bad to us. Also, indigenous peoples, they have to be more united. Today, I'm one of the secretaries of the of one of an indigenous entity. And I don't see a lot of unity. And I think that we need to discuss more to expose these crooks who they are covered by this blanket of power. And we forget about these guys. And then tomorrow they will come here as candidates and they, they will say they are good people. But he is one of, they are one of the men that are causing trouble to the people, these people. So I'm here in Chapala Diamantina, in our territory, a territory that was uh, granted as from the state. So we negotiated with the government of the state. It was a long negotiation, almost five years, and we could have a document from the government. We don't have the possession of the land, but we have the right to occupy the land. This territory is delimited by the state. And now we want the operation of FUNAI. And here in Chapal de Montina, the right is to preserve the livelihood and the quality of the watersheds. This place is where the great cacique Sacambosu died in the 17th century. 
and we still preserve his image and we preserve this land. So this is it. Thank you so much to you all. I'm really honored to have the opportunity to be talking to you and to provide this denouncing of Mr. Goyce and other writers that they are shameless. They talk about hate in their books and they brought disgrace to indigenous people. Great, a big hug to you all. Thank you, Kasika. I really love to listen to you. I have some of your books in my home, actually. So I would just like to have this final round. And I'm going to ask Kasiki Kukun for the final words. I think all your words, it's important to know that we have many, a lot of denouncing action that could be done in a more articulated way, more integrated way. This is an agenda that we have to move forward to improve the leadership. Now I'd like to ask Kasiki Kukun if you could open your microphone and give your final statements. First of all, I'd like to thank God to for given, have given this opportunity. We see that some of us have been teachers for our people. I thank you all for that. I thank for the participation of Tiara. She's a leader in our community, Siratan as well. So many people contributed to this meeting. I'm happy to have had this meeting. It is a moment of learning for us with the technology that is quite advanced that enables us to have this from our community. It's really a privilege to have this advanced technology. We need it. And for this to happen, we need to have electricity. We need to have drinking water for our people. So I'm quite thankful for participating in this meeting. I thank you all for the opportunity that you gave us to have this dialogue, this conversation. And this is basically what I have have to say for us together, right together, defeated by these bad wolves, as you see that the example of Mr. Jossi Goiz, who claims himself as the owner of Bahia, but we are the first original people of this land, and we will not give our land away to any person, foreigners, who come taking our people out of our lands. We are here to fight together with our peoples, our relatives. We will never give our land to these crooks, to these people. So I thank you very much. And we hopefully we're going to have more meetings. It's not the, the only one. Thank you so much for the opportunity be in this meeting with you. Thank you, Kasik Tukun. It's always great to listen to you all. Now I'm going to hand the floor to Yara. To Yara, can you speak to us? Yeah, sure. Well, after this strong talk, resistance talk of Kasik Juvenal and Kasik Tukun, I only have to reestate the importance of fighting for the guarantee of our rights. We have two articles in our constitution that guarantee basic rights to us, so we have to keep fighting. And it's not the negative statements and the attacks that we suffer that will, um, will defeat us. We're going to be stronger and stronger and resist. Again, I'd like to say that it's important for the female indigenous, the ladies, the indigenous women, to be participating in the struggles. They are not behind the warriors. They are side by side with them. 
our rule is this. We tend to listen a lot, observe a lot, and then we provide the knowledge and the wisdom that we learned from our ancestors. Also, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to be here, to be alive, to be healthy, and to be able to just give the testimony of what's happening in our communities. Thank you so much, Tatiana, and the participation of all. Dinama, for your partnership. Doesn't matter what role, what position you are in this institution, but your presence is important. And we make in this moment of struggle, moments that makes our existence uh, in danger, we need to keep strong, keep fighting. Thank you, Tiara. It's always important. Could you please tell us your final words? I mean, your your ending statements. Well, I'd like to thank you for the space again, for listening to our suffering, our anguish. I'd like to thank my relatives who are marching with us, our the doctors, the lawyers, the indigenous lawyers who dedicate to our cause, helping to leverage our fight. I'd like to thank our ancestors, uh, the great spirit to provide health to us and strength to keep fighting. From the bottom of my heart, thank you all for transmitting this live video to other countries. And we take this moment to invite everyone who's watching us. If you come to Porto Seguro or Santa Cruz de Cabralha, come to our community, come participate, live what we're living, see our reality. As originary people of this land, we want to have the presence of the society in our communities. Don't just read the books, the history books, or don't listen to the government who wants the indigenous people to be far from the society. We think of equality, equity. That means that we want to be side by side with the other people in society. We want to, we are here and our home is open for all the participants of this group, Tatiana, Sheila, our interpreters, our lawyers, the cacique. I hadn't had the privilege to meet you all yet, but the words that he says are words of fight, of struggle. So I invite cacique Maya. I don't know you in person yet, so please come here you are welcome to, to visit us. So we thank you so much and the great spirit should bless you all. So be it. And I'm going to ask Cacique Juvenal to, for his final remarks and then Dinamar. Our uh, majestic mother nature, thank you so much implore the end of this infamous uh, agony. I see the virus throwing up, but we need to water the seeds, leave the, the fish living in the lake and our indigenous to come to the new world with poetry with no weapons and with the view that from of the one that created so this is my prayer for god to be with you all with us all and dr vladimir please please uh, unmute your microphone yeah it's quite hard to speak after such beautiful 
statement. The importance of this type of event is to provide visibility to these people, to their demands and their problems, and the need to strengthen this fight. The need for everyone to be participating in the purpose of helping them. I cannot give many details, even because of uh, to protect our strategy, but, but we are, are planning on a visit to the communities so that we can in the international communities, and especially the community of Ponta to congratulate the organization of the event. I congratulate the World Social Forum in this visibility to the peoples that are normally unvisibilized. So I thank you and I congratulate the forum. Yeah, I thank you so much. The forum is this space to reflect on another possible world. This is the motto of the farm, and it has to be present. Sheila, would you like to say a little, give you give us a few words? You are quite quiet. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, you can, you can speak now, and then I will finish. It really moves me to listen to all these statements. They carry a lot of truth, and it's undeniable the situation that they are experiencing. What comes to mind is the expression that we need to re-educate the look that we have upon ourselves and to re-educate the look that the world has of us. In this perspective, the World Social Forum has thought to be not only an but more than that, a process. And I keep thinking here of the importance of this visibility. The gathering of forces. The situation of the, the traditional peoples, they touch anyone who gets closer to them. The situation is we feel their truth and we know how hard it, their reality is. So here we have the idea to finish this edition of the world's virtual World Social Forum Starting our our march to the social forum in Mexico, when the sanitary situation is solved, we don't know when the, the next forum in Mexico will be, but we intend to promote virtual uh, gatherings as well in this process until we get to the, the, the forum. Whites and non-whites, indigenous and non-indigenous, people in general to be participating in this discussion, to give more strength to this fight. I think it's a possibility. And uh, on behalf of the International Council, I can say that we should think of ways to enable this visibility, how to bring this to a larger public. How can we take this to the representatives of social, uh, of civil society, of Europe, of Africa, of India, of Asia in general. I think it's very important. And as much as possible, we can contribute. We can count on the, the collective, the Brazilian collective of the International Council. I know I can speak on behalf of the organizations that are part of, of that council. So whatever, uh, in what what is in our in our power, whatever is in our power, you can count on us. So we had moments of strong emotion, and I opportunity. Big hug to you all. Thank you, Sheila, very much. And well, I'm daughter of Oshasi and daughter of Oshasi, this is what we are. I feel quite, quite connected to, to it, to them, to, these, to the indigenous people. And I agree with you, the exercise to 
expand this narrative and to build the, the narrative, other narratives. The, the institution APIB has an important role on that. It's an important communication movement, such as we also have other communication movements, such as Media Ninja. There was an, an excellent uh, communication work last year. Tiara is a great photographer, by the way. And it's really important. This reaction and the look of narrative of the indigenous people. I think the forum could and can expand this and it's the exercise of gathering indigenous people and white people and non-white and non-indigenous with the challenge of thinking where I want to go, what place I want to reach and how can I do that? How can we have this better possible world? As my son was right here, He wanted to part here with me. He was here in a, to end the floor to Dinama. It was my fault that we were late, were delayed. But I'm going to ask Dinama to speak. I don't know if he's still there. I think he got disconnected. Yeah, he's not here anymore. Well, since he cannot come back, I'd like to thank you all that we have here uh, organized by Siranda communication that we do. Also, to listen to narratives, this topic is quite it's a dear uh, topic for our institution, Miranda. We also talk about the advocacy of the original people on environmental justice, and it's really key to potentialize these these counter narratives. I'd like to thank everyone who was who has been here. It was hard to to put all this together. Our dear interpreter, who who long as crazy to English, is going to help us help us uh, later. And I'd like to thank you, and say that world another world is possible. We cannot lose hope. Thank you so much. Good night. Ciao, gente. Boa noite. Obrigada. Mm-hmm.